science. 
But we do know that there is functional localization in the brain. Even though you look at this big mass of the cortex and it all looks homogeneous, it's not. In the next couple of, uh, the next two blocks, we're gonna talk about primary motors or primary cortices. And by that we mean those gyri that I showed you uh, in the last block. Where does motor control arise? Where does sensory information? So somatosensory motor cortex. But what about some of these other areas, like areas for language? We touched on Broca's and Wernicke's area a little bit. We'll touch on it again today. What about that whole cortex in front of the motor cortex? Or, well, we won't get into olfactory, but we will get into the temporal lobe a little bit. So we know that the brain parcels out its function to very distinct areas. And again, here's a, an MRI, functional MRI. And if somebody is hearing something, this is supposed to be an outline of the, of the cortex. This is the area, it's kind of where we said Wernicke's area was. See, your occipital lobe tends to light up. Thinking, your prefrontal cortex. You know, speaking, the area where, where Broca's uh, area was located. Much more precise than phrenology. You can actually link it to something that a person is doing or, or not doing, as, as the case may be. So, Here's kind of a schematic of our, our cortex. And the areas that are colored in orange are what we would call our primary cortex. Areas, again, that we're gonna cover in more detail. Primary motor, primary sensory visual hearing. Not what I wanna talk about today. What we wanna talk about are what are called the association areas. And those are these areas that are kind of gold or tan in color. And we're gonna kind of take a, a little tour through different areas. And I can't do everything in one lecture, but give you kind of a flavor for what's happening in some of these areas. And we'll come back to all of those orange areas uh, starting next week. So let's start with our prefrontal cortex, the prefrontal association areas. This would be the cortex that sits right over your eyes. There's a shelf of bone in there that kind of supports that part of our cortex. And it's usually divided into a ventral and medial area. So here's a medial view of the cortex, this ventral medial area. And that has a lot of connections with the limbic system. So that's gonna be an area where maybe a lot of emotional uh, flavor is put on things. I'm gonna probably primarily talk more about this dorsal and lateral part of the prefrontal cortex, this area in blue. Because this is kind of the area, what they call the executive functions, making decisions, planning, thinking about what you're gonna have for dinner tonight. Uh, foresight and working memory are all stored up in that area. And what's really interesting about this area, this is one of the last areas of the cortex to mature. So here we have a five-year-old, and if it's red or yellow, that means it's less mature the opposite of what I would have done, but blue and purple means it's getting there to be fully mature. You know, does a five-year-old make good decisions? You know, can he control himself in, in proper social settings and that? Sometimes, but you know, not so much. Even a preteen, it's beginning to change, but it's still very immature. It's not getting all the connections, all the cells maybe have not expressed all of their spines and get synaptic inputs. Okay, let's come up to teen saying, here's kind of your, you guys, you're in this range, right? 20 year olds or plus. Mm -hmm. 
So, you know, maybe, maybe a couple of years ago, when you were in your teen years, you would think, gee, it would be fun to jump off the roof into that snowbank. No common sense. Nowadays, you're going to think, that might not be a good idea. Although, clearly, there are some people who are thrill seekers, and they're that way throughout life. And it would be interesting to really do some studies on their prefrontal cortex to see how different it is from, uh, from, from the rest of us who don't want to go you know, jumping off mountains and hang gliding all the time. Okay? So, you know, maybe explain some teen behavior, preteen behavior. It takes time for this area to mature to make the right decisions. So, kind of, as I said, this is an area where you have personality, working memory, and working memory means memory where you can, you have lots of transitory bits of information, and you put them all together to go, okay, that thing has wheels, and it's got a motor inside of it, and I remember something about that, and oh yeah, that's a car. So that's working memories in that area. As we're going to see in the upcoming lectures, it actually does get information from both your motor and your sensory cortex. And it uses that for higher level functioning. We will, we will talk about that. We'll talk a little bit about it today. Where am I in relation to the world? And how should I plan my behaviors so I appear normal in a good social set of situation? Appropriate behavior. When you have damage to that area, you have lots of issues. You may not carry out behaviors that are appropriate to whatever the circumstance is. So impaired restraint, disordered thoughts, inability to plan an action. And you know, if you look at that, that does kind of have some of the hallmarks of schizophrenia. And this is an area that people are looking at in saying and found that this area is not as active in individuals who are suffering from schizophrenia. So Here's, I don't know if this is interesting or frightening. This individual, Antonio Igas Moniz from Portugal, and back probably in the late 40s, he decided, you know, there's a lot of people out there who aren't behaving properly, who maybe do have outbursts, who can't interact socially. And he thought, how could we treat these people? And his solution was to do what's called a lobotomy, sometimes called a leucotomy, or psychosurgery. And what they would do is they would take a knife and they would come up through the roof of your orbit and literally get up into that area and just cut it back and forth. Or in some cases they would take, and there's one person who got really carried away with it, he would go around the country and offer this to anybody who wanted it to be done on, you know, one of their relatives who were. And he would use an ice pick and just go in there and scramble everything up. The only one I know of any note was um, Jack, John, John Kennedy's father had it done to one of his daughters. I think his wife did not want to talk to him again for a very long time. She, and she did have some, she had some, she had some behavioral problems, but this was not the solution. Now, this doesn't seem like a very sensible approach, but what really is interesting about this, he got the Nobel Prize for that. <laughs> Sometimes they don't get it right, okay? In 49, the therapeutic value of the economy in certain psychoses. Now, we know a lot different now. And I'm putting this into the context. They didn't have the drugs that we have now to treat this. And he was just trying to figure out a way that maybe we could help these people. 
probably used between the 40s, early 50s. For those, of, majority was carried out on women because, of course, women at those times, you know, they were at all emotional or probably trying to be strong. We had to correct that. Mortality rate, surprisingly, was fairly low at 5%. I would be afraid of cutting a lot of arteries and things, but he said they seemed to do okay. And then in about the, the mid-50s, a lot of the antipsychotic drugs started coming on the market, Thorazine. And now, of course, we have a whole market of antidepressants and anti-anxiety type drugs to treat some of them, and schizophrenic, schizophrenia medications. <clears throat> so again, they would just kind of come in, make that cut. The problem was, so here's another thing where we learned a lot about what that part of the cortex was doing. After it was done, most of these people went just the opposite direction. Yeah, they weren't combative anymore, and they weren't doing anything maybe totally inappropriate, but they had no ambition. They did have some loss of morals, because that also does control, that's kind of our social, socially appropriate behavior. Can't carry out long trains of thought. Uh, ability to solve complex problems or to do sequential tasks, like taking the cap off your toothpaste, putting the toothpaste on the brush and then brushing your teeth, that's a sequence. Parallel tasks, can't do parallel tasks at the same time. Uh, walking and chewing gum, they always talk about. And it did, it did decrease some aggressiveness. Okay, so, who has not heard of Phineas Gage? Oh good. So Phineas Gage is kind of the poster child for prefrontal lobotomy, unintentional. So you all know he was a railroad worker, using a rod to tamp dynamite into a hole. Dynamo dynamite exploded. And it shot, this was the reconstruction that was done in the early 90s. They actually had his skull, I think it's at Harvard. And they kind of did a reconstruction of what they thought where the rod went. And it kind of went up through his orbit, and look where it went, right into that prefrontal cortex, and then out his skull uh, on the other side. And there's the rod. They actually have the rod and his skull. Uh, I don't know if it's on display or not, but I know it's, it's there. They said he didn't lose consciousness, and you probably wonder why, and as we will see in a future lecture, consciousness actually resides in a different part of the brain than the cortex. The cortex is involved, but you can, you can lose a lot of your cortex and still stay conscious. Um, you know, he, they got him to a doctor. You don't always hear, he, he did, of course, an infection set in, because they didn't have a lot of the antibiotics and that. And he was an invalid for a very long time. But fortunately, apparently, this doctor he went to did miracles, and he didn't wind up dying of an encephalitis or uh, anything else associated with that. And for all intents, he didn't have any motor deficits, he didn't have any sensory deficits, so it didn't involve the motor cortex or that. But just as we were just talking about, what he lost was his ability to reason, to follow social norms, he became nasty, vulgar, irresponsible, and you know, they always say Gage was no longer Gage, he was no longer a capable foreman. So they fired him, and he went around the country with his camp, that's we made a living, went around with his camping rod, telling his story about how this thing went up into his head. And apparently, from what I read, he did, he might have had some recovery, because he went down to South America and became a, a stagecoach driver, which requires some ability to plan and figure out what, where you are and that, and interact with people. So a little bit more on, on Phineas Gage, but, there's a perfect example of prefrontal lobotomy. Okay? So that's what I want to tell you about the frontal lobe. So we're going to, kick, like I said, we're going to kind of take a little tour. 
from a couple of areas. So let's turn now to the parietal lobe. So in the orange, we have our primary sensory uh, cortex, which is that post-central gyrus. That's where information comes up and we can interpret where I'm feeling something, the intensity of the pain, of, of the input. But what about this area posterior to the primary sensory cortex? And I remember we've talked before about how the parietal lobe has some overlap with the occipital lobe and some overlap with the temporal lobe. Okay, so what do we know when we have lesions in this area? Well, there are some really unique features of parietal lobe damage. One of which is you stop paying attention to objects that are contralateral to the lesion. I'll show you that a little bit more in a minute. And we have a couple of terms here that I do want you to know. First one is apraxia. And that means no abs. Whenever you have A in front of something, you just think no, right? So no action. So you can't, what these people wind up, depending on which side it's on, that's the other thing that's going to be interesting with the parietal lobe. You have different symptoms if the damage is on the right side or the left side. Our dominant hemisphere versus our, our non-dominant hemispheres. And in the apraxia, you don't carry out actions in the right sequence. You can't carry them out purposefully. And kind of as a side sidebar to that, you don't use objects in the right way. I'm going to show you an example of that. And this is primarily with damage, as we're looking here at the brain, on the left side. So our dominant, for most of us, our dominant hemisphere. If you're right-handed, the left side is your dominant hemisphere. Aphasia means no speech. Remember, we've got Wernicke's area back in here. And I am going to jump back to the frontal lobe a little bit to pick up Broca's area uh, in when we talk more about aphasia. And again, that also is mostly related to damage on the dominant hemisphere or the left hemisphere. And then we're going to talk about something called neglect syndrome. And this is where you deny that there's objects in your left visual field, including your own body. This is not my arm. Get rid of it. What is that thing doing in this bed with me? Okay, and that is associated with damage to your non-dominant or your right side. So let's look at apraxia first. So here's a gentleman. It's a little spaced out here, but you give him a pair of scissors and he's using it for a comb. He's got an object. He can move. There's clearly no motor deficits in this case. But he doesn't know what to do with that. And then he was asked to put on his pajama top. Again, you see no motor deficits, but he's kind of putting his, you know, his right arm in the left sleeve, and he's probably got it upside down, and he can't properly sequence that. And he doesn't know what he's doing. So you can't, you use them for the wrong purpose, and you don't carry them out in, in sequence. I have a friend who, who called me and said, my sister-in-law is driving me crazy. She's just, she's using, you know, tweezers to eat her dinner, and she can't make coffee. She's putting the water, you know, in where the coffee should go, and the coffee where the water should go. Well, it turned out she had a tumor in her left hemisphere. And, you know, those were the classic symptoms. And those, that may be some of the, you know, you might not be aware of the tumor there until you do start seeing these being manifest. So, unfortunately, she didn't survive the, the tumor because it had gotten too large at that time. 
but she said, I don't know what's wrong with her. You know, she just can't, she's just behaving so weird. You know, I'm a neuroscientist, so they're gonna call me and say, I'm not a cop. <laughs> Go see someone. <clears throat> so, what, what about the sequencing? So here we're talking about this area of the parietal lobe. Remember I told you about those uh, Brogman areas? This is sometimes referred to as areas five and seven. I should say Brogman, not Broca's areas. Uh, Brogman, but it doesn't matter. It's this association area of the cortex. Well, it turns out this part of the cortex actually sends connections up into an area just in front of our motor cortex. It's called the supplementary motor area. Again, we'll see this down the road and I'll come back to it. The supplementary motor area is very important for sequencing movement. So if we damage the parietal lobe, it's not getting that input and we don't do things in the right sequence. So here again, parietal lobe is talking to frontal lobe. You damage that pathway and things go a little haywire. What about damage on the right side? Notice the brain is turned around here. So now we're looking at the right side of the cortex. And this is overlap of, what is it, eight patients who had damage to this area. So there was either less or more, but this is kind of the critical area that's right in here. Again, this could be due to a stroke, could be due to a tumor that's destroying the underlying tissue. And what this occurred, what happens when you have damage in this area, again, probably because of this association with part of the occipital lobe there, you begin to ignore parts of your visual space. And the effects could be what they call egocentric, which means yourself. Like I said, you know, people who just deny they even have a left side of their body anymore or what they call allocentric when you're denying objects on the left side, or you could have both together. So what do we mean by that, and how would you determine that? So here's a test that they would do to look at that. So you show the patient a picture of a house, and you say, copy that. Now you guys could sit down, I presume, and make a nice drawing to some degree of that house. A patient with that kind of injury, notice they only drew that half of the house. They didn't draw anything on the left side as we're looking at it. Okay, here's a line. Bisect the line. Now most of us would probably go somewhere in here so I've got half the line here and half the line there. And they're bisecting it here, which means they thought the line only went maybe to that point. They ignored the whole rest of that line. I can't imagine, this is a hard one for me to even imagine how this happens. And here, this, you're just saying, okay, cross out all of the lines. And again, we see this predominance of crossing out lines on one side and ignoring all of the others over on the left side. So these are kind of classic neurological tests that you can do when you suspect the patient has this type of deficit. Egocentric, so that's allocentric because you're looking at objects. This was person was an artist and he had damage, he had a stroke on the right side. And he began to doing began to do self portraits. And notice he's not drawing his left side. As he began to recover, well, he's kind of bringing it in, but there's you know it's kind of pale and 
maybe he's slowly acknowledging it, and then over time, this individual did have some recovery and was able to, to come back. Oh no, they see it. I mean, they may be, you know, they'll be in their bed and you'll bring them a meal. Well, that's, this is still the yellow center. You bring them a meal and they'll only eat what's on the right side of the plate. But they'll also say, get that arm out of my bed. That's not mine. Get rid of it. I don't know. But if they're ignoring it, then they're just saying it doesn't exist. Like I say, in my brain, that would be really a hard one to, hopefully none of you or I will ever have to experience that and have to answer that question. But that, that is a really, you know, I, I told you before I was a physical therapist and I did have one or two patients with this condition. It's really hard to do rehab when somebody doesn't want to Acknowledge that we have to do something with this arm. Now, we have to do some exercise. Well, it's not mine. Get rid of it. Are there like muscles that you could, they just don't use it? Well, usually these are accompanied with stroke, so it may involve more of the cortex, but if it involves that area in particular, now a tumor could be isolated, and yeah, you would start having some, some deficits. Disuse, disuse atrophy. So you don't think about what your brain is doing. And you said like movement in general is not impaired in, the, in these cases. I'm sorry? You said movement was not impaired in these cases, right? Put a mask down. I'm sad. There's either the acoustics here or I just can't hear. Yeah, uh, I asked if the movements were not impaired. Oh, if movements were not impaired? They, you know, the limb probably moves spontaneously. So there is some control and there is always reflexes. Again, we'll talk about reflexes coming up. There's always some muscle tone. We never go totally flaccid unless you cut the nerve to the muscles, okay? So yeah, there's always some, but they don't want to do anything purposeful with it. Gotcha. Okay, 
So normally, our right association area is very dominant. And it's paying attention to things bilaterally. The left will weakly pay attention to things over here on the right. So really, we need this right cortex to pay attention. Now let's take out the right hemisphere. All we have left is this very weak area of the parietal lobe from the other side that is paying attention to things on the right side. So that's why they still acknowledge that there is something there. But we've totally lost this input from the left side and a good part of what's on the, on the right side. If you lesion the right hemisphere, you don't have that deficit because the left, I'm sorry, if you've done damage to left hemisphere, the right hemisphere is taking care of both sides for us. Make sense? So the thing is, keep your, keep your right hemisphere healthy as far as you can. Okay, moving on to another topic, aphasias. So aphasia, as we just said, was some problem with language. And these were the two gentlemen for whom those areas of the cortex were named. They're both neurologists. This is Paul Broca and Carl Bernicke. And they studied these areas. And Broca, kind of interest though, let's, let's define Broca's area first and then I'll come back to his patient. So again, here's our primary motor cortex. And right, kind of at the base of it, and extending a little bit rostral, is what's now called Broca's area. And it turns out, when we look at our cortices, both sensory and motor, there's a very precise somatotopic organization. For now, let's just notice that Cells that are either receiving sensory information from the face or that are sending motor output to control muscles in the face is located on the lateral side and pretty much inferior. So the motor area would be right here for face and mouth control, right next to Broca's area. <coughs> Okay, so here's the actual brain of the individual that Broca was studying that allowed him to define this as an important area for motor output, of, for the motor component of speech. And the patient was called Tan. I'll tell you why in a minute. He really had a real name. I, I don't speak French, but Le Bourne, something like that. Le Bourne. Okay. And this was at autopsy, what they saw. So, Tan developed epilepsy in his youth. Okay, this is, this is kind of a lesion right here. Here's, I think this is a little wonky, but here's the precentral gyrus. Here's that area immediately rostral to that. And it's very close to the temporal lobe. And we know the temporal lobe in many individuals is an area where epileptic seizures can be initiated. He had, so this is the left side of his brain, so he had right-sided weakness and over four years to a real hemiplegia, probably because they, he was beginning, the lesion was huge here, but I'm sure it was beginning to involve that adjacent primary motor cortex. <coughs> he could understand what people were saying to him, but no matter what you asked him, 
His response was always, can, can. What time is it? Can. You know? What are you going to wear today? Can. What do you want to eat? Can. So that's where that, if you ever do any reading on this, you want to eat that pepper? term came up. a lot of the limbic system and that can put a whole different spin on things. I would guess if, if I had to really think about it. We don't want to know what he was saying then probably. Yeah, it's something different. Probably nothing different. So here was the first case where somebody, is, he was a neurologist so he, he worked with this man for many, many years. And then when they did the autopsy and found this huge cyst-like hole in this area, the conclusion was that's where language is generated because he could understand it, but he couldn't develop comprehensive speech. The other things are just from progression. I don't have the same image for a Bernanke. I'm not sure what work he was doing. I tried to look for it one time. But for Wernicke, again, a neurologist and probably had a patient that had damage in this kind of the area where the temporal lobe and the parietal lobe come together. And this first kind of gyrus in the temporal lobe, this is where our auditory information is processed. So that's primary auditory cortex. And interesting, Wernicke's area sits right next to our primary auditory cortex. And there is, there are, there are connections, we talked about these a little bit last time, between Wernicke's area and Broca's area called the superior longitudinal fasciculus, and it's on the same yeah. side. And notice again here, I should say, I don't notice, but these language centers are primarily on the right side of the, I'm sorry, the left side of the brain. So again, our dominant hemisphere. We'll talk a little bit about what's happening on the other side. Okay, so what if you lesion, just Wernicke's area. You have what's called a receptive aphasia. And that means they can't comprehend what you're saying to them. It just sounds like gibberish. They can have, they can have spontaneous speech. I mean, they could just start talking. There's no problem with Broca's area. And the other thing that's associated with that is what they call a gnomic, where they have difficulty finding the right word for something. If you ask them, what is this? And of course they can't understand what you're asking, but even if you would kind of point and say, you know, what, what, tell me what that is. And they'll just go, uh, hard, move, maybe they could come up with mouse. Maybe not. Do any of you remember the senator who was shot in Arizona so many years ago, Gabby Giffords? She, again, was a senator. Somebody shot her in the head while she was at one of her speeches. And the damage was, again, primarily on her left hemisphere. And they did a really nice video. I've got, I've got a copy of it. I've got to get it digitized so that I can maybe show parts of it. But you can probably go out onto YouTube or something and just look up Gabby Giffords. And part of her rehab, she had, she had motor deficits because of the, the damage, but the bullet actually did damage uh, part of her speech centers. And 
they would give her something and she would go hot cards, water, and it was a cup. And then they would tell her what it is and she would just go, oh, goofy Gabby, goofy Gabby. I mean, she was aware that she couldn't create those words, uh, which, which was a problem. She, she, got, she did get again, she had some recovery of function, and, but her speech has always been a little more, more hesitant if you hear her speak now. Okay, motor aphasia, if you damage Broca's area. You know what somebody is saying to you, kind of like Pan, but you just can't make anything comprehensible. You can't respond to it. Uh, you may just make words that make no sense whatsoever. If you damage that superior longitudinal fasciculus, called the conduction aphasia. You can understand, and you can have spontaneous speech, but you wouldn't be able to repeat. If I tell you to say the word cat. Don't. Nobody's gonna say the word cat? <laughs> Do you have a patient? <laughs> and then if you had damage, to the whole you know, massive stroke that took out all of that, that's called global aphasia, with no repetition, no comprehension. Again, difficulty forming words of that. And again, this is on our uh, left side, so this is also like the apraxia on the dominant side. this was kind of an interesting PET scan. When you're looking at words, as you'd expect, your visual cortex lights up. You guys right now are listening to words, so your temporal lobe is pretty active. Does this impact quantity of syllables? Because all the examples we've been given so far are like hard, soft, short words, pretty simple ones. Does worm piece of phasia impact anything with like longer syllables, longer words? You mean, well, I'm going to tell you about something called prosody in a minute. Is that what you're kind of referring to? How the, the way we inflect our voice when we talk? Or, so you're thinking longer words versus shorter words? I guess, I, I don't know. I just, I haven't thought about that. I don't think it would matter. Okay. But we are going to talk a little, I'm going to add one more thing on to this language issue in a few seconds. Okay. That, you know, when we speak, we don't speak like our robot and have no inflection. Well, maybe some people do, but you know. We try to put a little tone in it and a little, or if we ask a question, our voice goes up. If we make a statement, it, it has a very different kind of inflection. That's occurring somewhere else. Thank you. When you're talking, this would be the area for Broca. And then I don't know why generate, well, generating verbs, of course, Broca's area is gonna be active. So there's this area back here in your temporal lobe. I haven't quite figured that one out, why, why they saw that pattern. It has been shown, maybe, maybe this is what you were kind of getting at, is that there are areas, well, and that's kind of going back to that temporal lobe idea, but that's auditory. And just look at this area with the dashed lines. And when they're hearing words for referring to people, we see some activity here on the left. Animals, a different area of your auditory cortex like it's always on the left. So it's you know still in the in the auditory area. And when you're hearing words related to tools. So it appears that the temporal lobe. When it does get sound, this isn't necessarily related to Wernicke, but when it's hearing things, very specific regions can be activated. 
Uh, what, what skills? Isn't it still like right afterwards and uh, still communicate that way? As far as I know, they really can't write them out either. So let's go to the, this next one. I'll come to that. So the dominant hemisphere, which again for most of us is our left hemisphere, that's where we've got this language, speech, and writing. So if you damage that, you're in calculations, kind of our math side. So if you damage that, the answer you said about writing, we're going to lose that. The non-dominant hemisphere, again for the right, that's where, as I was just saying, you add on that emotional expression, some of the tonal qualities, the rhythm, and the term that was used is isprosity. Singing, playing a musical instrument. Because the interesting thing with, with Gabby Giffords, she couldn't identify the object, but she could get through a whole song and sing it. And if they made up a song about a cup, it kind of started retraining her brain a little bit. And then she could sing about a cup. <laughs> so, you know, again, we look at our brain and we think it's very homogeneous. But in actuality, it's, it's really not. Very has areas that are very specifically related to different functions. Even within like hearing and speech, we have these two sides. And this question always comes up, well, what if somebody uses sign language? And the answer is, yep, if they have damage to that left hemisphere, they start making nonsense signs. So that's language, could be speech, could be sign language, whatever technique you use for communication. Basically, it's a communication center. You know, I think this is, yeah, this is the, this is the one that I think the, uh, the correct form, like there, you're supposed to point your hands straight up, and he's pointing way over here. To me, these don't look too far out of, out of sync from what they were. But they have shown that in people who do use sign language as their primary communication, if you damage that left hemisphere, they start making nonsense signs. Okay. Occipital lobe. We're moving our way back. So when we look on the medial side, here's that big parietal occipital fissure or sulcus, which you all know about now, so I can just say it, not have to go through it. And then there's another one that kind of divides the occipital lobe in half, called the calcarine sulcus. And on either side of that, that's and I'm not, I'm not going to worry about cuneus and lingual. That is our primary visual cortex. That is where the information from the lateral geniculate nucleus, which gets information from the retina, first terminates. So the question now is, well, what about all the rest of the occipital lobe? Okay, you guys ever heard of the what and the where pathways? taken some psychology courses, they probably dwelled on those, and you probably know more about them than I do. We have these pathways. So, visual core, primary visual cortex basically is getting a series of lines in different orientations. And then that information has to go to other parts of the occipital lobe to take that information and kind of put it together into Okay, I'm seeing a horizontal line, I'm seeing a vertical line, and some flatness in there. Okay, I pull up some memory, that's a table. And we can recognize objects. So the other parts of the cortex are involved in adding color, in adding movement. But there are also these pathways between the occipital lobe and the parietal and frontal lobe and between the occipital lobe and the temporal lobe. Don't worry about these abbreviations. 
And there again, connections between the association area. And in 2014, so not that long ago, these people deserved it. They got the Nobel Prize to O'Keefe, Moser, and, and Mae Britt Moser, that there are cells that actually form a positioning system in the brain. And we're gonna talk about those more when we get to the limbic system because that's where they're really prominent. But this information, it's actually better on this one. So you go from primary visual cortex to all these secondary, and then into the temporal lobe, and this upper pathway is telling you where you are in space. And this pathway that takes you down to the association areas of the temporal lobe give you some information about what you're looking at. And again, this, this became a little bit more complex after they got, when they got to the, their studies with the Nobel Prize, um, what they called it a visual spatial processing system, contributing both to spatial perception and non-conscious spatial processing. So you have these projections that are coming from the association areas of the visual cortex. They're going up here to our premotor area. They're going up into that prefrontal area. And, oh, that's it, and it's flipping over to the temporal lobe. And remember I said working memory was up in that prefrontal area. So it's taking that bit of information. Okay, something is flat. I know something about that, and it's vertical, and it's sitting on the floor. Those are little snippets that I might have in my memory, and I can put all of that together to say, okay, I think that's a table. Not be wrong, but you know, maybe it's a desk. I have looked over here. So this that's why I think you don't see this very sharp border between posterior parietal rostral occipital, and temporal lobes, because they're really interacting. Okay, so temporal lobe, what if we damage some of those temporal lobe association areas? And this gives rise to what's called agnosia. And it's different from apraxia and it's different from neglect syndrome. In neglect syndrome, they're denying the object. But in agnosia, you know, and that can be mere multiple forms, tactile. I can put my hand in my pocket and even though I can't see anything, I've done this thing before, okay, I can feel something hard and long and it's got a little kind of teeth on it, so I know that I'm pulling out my keys. With tactile agnosia, you can touch something, you know, you, you can have a barrier up, and they're asking you to feel keys, mouse, whatever, and you can't recognize it by touch. Visual agnosia, again, you could see something, you're not blind, but you just can't determine what that is. And again, part of that that association area coming in from the visual cortex. Alexia is inability to recognize words or letters. And auditory, you hear a sound, but you know, you don't you don't really know what the sound is or the tune that's being played. So agnosia is it's not like you're denying it. It's just that you can't use the senses that you normally use to identify an object. Okay, we're gonna do just a little bit of this. If you lesion the right temporal lobe, okay, so our non-dominant, you can't recognize spaces or objects. And the mnemonic for that is four. Space, object, right. Lesions of the left temporal lobe tend to be more, less, more language related, the Wernicke's area. 
We said that remembered language is on our dominant side, the left hemisphere. So language left, LL. So four for objects and face on the right, LL language on the left. Let's look at that a little bit. I will never ask you to spell this word, but I like it. Prosopagnosia. You can use that someday and really impress somebody, right? Basically, it just means can you recognize a face? Okay? You know? You know that somebody is your wife, your husband, your child. Or you just look at them and go, I have no clue who this is. And uh, Oliver Sacks, again, was a neurologist, and he wrote a lot of books, but this one was The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. <laughs> he had no clue who she was or what. And so let's look at the temporal lobe, and this is mostly on the medial side. So here's our occipital lobe, and kind of right at this junction, V4, visual, supplementary visual 4. That's where we add color to our vision. And then right in front of that, this little red area that's essential for recognizing faces. If you have any kind of tumor, cyst, mini strokes that takes out that area, then you can't, you don't recognize faces. And that area, the green area, that's different. You can recognize the face, but you don't recognize their expression. And we don't realize how important it is, you know, if I look out and I see you guys going, huh? You know, I might go back over something again, or is somebody happy, is somebody sad, is somebody angry? And as we'll, we'll come back to that when we talk about the limbic system. That's very much amygdala related. But this little red area kind of in between is what's essential or recognizing somebody. So you said uh, you can't recognize a teacher looking at they don't recognize you, they just can't recognize the person at all. Well, oh, they know it's a person. How did you mistake his wife for a hat? So let me, let me show you this. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think what? How did you mistake his wife for a hat? Oh, <laughs> I think he had some other issues. <laughs> <laughs> So here's normally you present an image of a face to somebody, and there's that little area of the temporal lobe lighting up. Face area lights up. They've done these studies with primates, trained them, and they show them different faces, and maybe they distort the face, they cut half of it away, Show them a human face. And this is neural activity. So when they see something that looks like them, neural activity increases. You kind of scramble the face up and they're going, nah, I don't know, I have no clue what I'm looking at here. <coughs> Cutting the face, they kind of get, they get a sense of what's there. And then here's again a normal response. They will respond to a human, which is nice. Hand, who cares? I don't care about hand. And there are some neurons, actually, that prefer the, so this would be a cell that likes the face kind of looking straight at you. And we actually have cells who prefer profiles. So going back two slides, sorry. Um, what happens if you region the V4 color sector of the brain? What happens if you what? If you region the V4 section of the brain? If you region V4, yeah. you have You'd no color. So, like, so that everything would just appear kind of gray. Gray, okay. Yeah. Yeah, gray. Okay, so some, you have a profile, the cell fires, again, control, show them a brush, or whatever that is, and the cell doesn't respond. Gray is not very interesting. Okay. Actually, we'll talk about this more later, but let's look at this from the bottom. Again, temporal lobes, there's this 
what's called a para-hippocampal driver's sketch was, guess what it's surrounding? How about the hippocampus? And, you know, this again is that what pathway, it involves input to this area, so it's going to, it doesn't care about faces or bodies um, or inanimate objects, but it, for some reason it seems to really like things that are outside. Again, more of a uh, navigational area. So let's do, so let's just turn this over. Here's your question. Here's V4, colorblind. And then just rostral to that is our prosopagnosia or our face recognition area. And then kind of kind of in between, wrapping around just a little bit more lateral, is an area where you're going to see object. So I can look at that and I can say that is a table. Or this is a mouse. Okay. I hope that, you know, I just think that's kind of interesting. It's the one